Hello, I'm Mark Hales. I wrote the feature on the Percival Mugal replica created by David Beale, which you see in the last issue. Here's a little bit more of the interview I did with David, which formed the basis for the feature. And as you can see, the batteries in the iPhone ran out before we'd really finished, but I think you'll get the idea. Right, um, thank you ever so much for coming down. Um, that's because um, I've always wanted one. <laughs> Ever since right. I was a kid doing control line models. Uh, at some point then, you thought, I can do this. So it has to be a, there has to be a point at which you said, I am going to start now. No. Um, when, you, when I had the, tip, the tipsy, everyone would say, well, what would you swap the tipsy for? And I said, a mule girl. It was the only thing I would say I'd swap it for. The tipsy just does everything I need. Um, and uh, there was XF up in Breton, but you know, that was way out of my price range. Um, and uh, so I got a Taylor Titch with a Walter Miner in it, which was my Mini Mew Girl. <laughs> and I was badgered to do that by a f very good friend of mine, Frank. Well, to build it from scratch? No, no, it was, it was a part built one. Uh, it's supposed to have done a test flight, but it was so badly rigged and put together, I ended up ripping it all to pieces and rebuilding it um, completely. Uh, you, know, you know, the controls were all wrong, and yeah, it was just, it was wrong. <laughs> and there was no way I was going to fly it. Because I bought the thing from the guy, and the guy said, oh, you can fly it back. And I went down there, and we looked at it. And I said, no, I'll be back tomorrow with the trailer. <laughs> he was, he was you know, really crestfallen, I just, just, it would have killed me. And you, you weren't put off by any of that? No, 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 it was, you know, it was reasonably cheap, and I was, I thought it was the only way I'm going to get anything like a Mugo, and as it turned out, it's, it's handling, it wasn't very far off. Um, it's got the same, it had the same power to weight ratio, it was 105 horsepower in a little tiny aeroplane, um, and it went like stink. <laughs> uh, and it would cruise at V&E. <laughs> Wow. And then one day, I was down at my parents in Somerset. And bored one evening, I got the pilot magazine out. And in the, ma in the back there was an advert. Mew Girl project for sale um, for quite a lot of money. I thought, um, and um, and I thought, sod it, this is the only chance I'm going to get to do this. So I phoned him up. Um, and it was Tony Ditheridge. Oh. <laughs> and Tony had, got, had bought um, a part complete fuselage, um, a Gypsy Queen 1, which was in fact uh, a Gypsy 6 2, converted for a fixed pitch prop. Brand new in a, crank, in a packing case. And for the whole, he wanted a fixed price for the whole lot. Plus, I could have access to all the drawings because he was building this replica for Alex Henshaw to go in the museum in Hendon. So those drawings came with it, got it, gulped, thought, OK. <sighs> Said to Tony Dillard, how much would you charge to build me a, a complete aircraft? Half a million quid. No, he said 100,000. I should have bitten his hand off because <laughs> it cost me more than that to do. Don't tell my no. wife. <laughs> and d did you do all this research before you actually? Uh-uh. No, should have done. <laughs> uh, <was> it? <laughs> you steamed num into it. Uh, yeah, you? steamed into it. And the number of times I had to rebuild stuff, I was mm. like, oh, that's not right. I'm, I'm familiar with all, all that. Again. You, you get so yeah. <clears throat> the zeal mm. of a project and you think, nah, it looks all right. I, said, mm. I know. It's, um, well, I'm glad somebody else does things like that. Too. Yeah. So you've got... a you got a fuselage which had been built by Ken Fern. Yeah, but it was um, too tall, and I had a few other bits and pieces right. which I then you know, researched and said this is all wrong. Do, so you got to Ken to do. To so I said to Ken, "Can you chop it down for me? I get the, the mm. thing the right size because you did it. Mm. You know how it all went." And he said, "Yeah, and did a deal with him and paid him to do that um, because at, at the time I had the titch in my workshop, so I didn't have space for it." I thought, actually, if I get that out, it's underway. At the same time, I went to Roger Burroughs and said, 
could you do me a wing? Now, I, I'm not, I, I know the name. Is he a glider man? Or? Hmm. No. Roger Burroughs is at Watersham. He specialises in doing wings, tiger moth wings and steerman wings and oh. all sorts of stuff like that. When I read Tom Story's reports on his rebuild of XF and what he did, um, that's he also said, I'm not going to build these spars. They are too specialist um, and you really need to know what you're doing. For a start, the centre sections are ash. That's spliced into spruce, uh, which is about three by two capping strips. Why would they make it? Strength. Oh, okay. I right. reckon this thing. I reckon this one's got nine G sa with a safety factor of two. When I did the stress calculations on wow. the wing, incredibly strong. That's why Henshaw managed to fly it through thunderstorms, fully loaded, without any trouble. It's just really strong. Right. Going back to the actual construction, mm -hmm. then. So you went to Burroughs. What, what's is it? What's mm -hmm. his first name? Roger. Roger Burroughs. That's mm -hmm. right. Yes. Um, well, Roger said, agreed a price to do the wings. I'd already got the ribs. Some of them were already built as part of the project. I got the rest of them built. Um, so I got him to build the spars and I said, they're complicated. You've got this ash, you've got this spruce. They taper and on the capping strips, there isn't a parallel face on them because they taper that way. They taper that way and they have an angle on the top for the, to fit the wing flat underneath so there isn't actually a parallel there's and no there's parallel presumably faces. some wash out at that yeah and the same underneath mm. and they have got dihedral <coughs> on them and they angle back <laughs> and you wow. think i haven't got a clue i'm going to make those <laughs> roger did right um wow. did a fabulous job on them and there's a pair of spars and they're they're massive they are that sort of section spars they're really hefty uh so he did those and um then said, you know, can you finish the wing off there because you've got the space. So we ri he rigged it all on the wall and I went over there and we put the wing together and skinned it and, and um, finished it all off, which was great. What, what about the metal bits? And I'd made all the metal bits. In the meantime, I'd made all the metal bits and right. had them professionally welded and put up. But then there was things like, oh, before we can put the wing together, I need all the undercarriage legs sorted out. So I had to make the undercarriage mounting brackets. Uh, are you a metal worker? Where, where yeah. Did you? yeah. I, I own an engineering company. Ah, right. Um, oh, the, we going jumping back a bit. Why did I do it? Um, I was looking for a project to take me away from work. I vowed to my um, co-director, the directors I'd appointed, um, to retire at 60 and let them get on with business. I tried getting some other directors in earlier on, a few years previously, and just fallen out. You know, they couldn't get on with me because I was interfering. I was, you know, it was my company. I founded the company. I, just, you know, and it was just, you know, into everything. It's a story I've heard. <laughs> so I, I knew if I was going to leave it to these other guys to carry on, I had to have something which was totally going to preoccupy me, uh, and I could wind down my part of the business, uh, my in, uh, involvement in the business, become the chairman, so stand back and just have this overview and sort of say, well, I wouldn't do it like that, but it's your decision. Um, and it's your neck. <laughs> and it's your livelihood. <laughs> uh, and, you know, they have done. It's been brilliant. So I started the project the and then I took one day a week on it. And then I said, I'll gradually build up to 60. And as I was doing it, I was gradually doing two days a week, plus every evening and weekend on it, if I wasn't flying. Um, and yeah, you know, and it ended up just being all consuming. I'll come home from work. Um, and you managed to have, stay married, have you? Yeah, yeah, because my wife was a teacher and so she had loads of, you know, marking yeah, and things yeah. like that to do in the evening. So what was I going to do? Sit and watch the TV or something, you know? So I was out in the workshop and she said, at least I know where you are. <laughs> <laughs> and the workshop joined the house, you know, so it was just a case. And the nice thing about it is with the workshop, when you're doing a project, if it's next to the house, you can sli you can go out and do five minutes. Yes. You can just glue that part, and yeah. you can go and have your dinner, and then come back, yeah. and it's glued, and you can carry on the next. Yes. Bit. The, yeah. Back to the undercarriage. Mm. You said it's a fork. Mm. Is it? So did you did you hop that out right. of the solid? No. 
the undercarriage fittings had to be made before the undercarriage before the wing was built because you can't get at them and bolt them up or drill the holes until you've got them and uh, I had three drawings and which one was right <laughs> ah I made three different <laughs> sets of undercarriage of course I chose the wrong one. <laughs> the right one was the last one I made <laughs> and the problem is because uh, so are those sorry uh, are, they, are those just um you know sort of bent folded is that sheet metal no, it, the sheet they're they're folded metal yeah um for the brackets that fit onto the wing and they are about yay long with eight bolts on each yeah each side it goes, through, it goes through the spar yeah go through the spar and then there's a center section where the leg fits into and right. i couldn't get the tube the section i wanted so it's a four inch diameter chunk of 4130, I machined down to 1 16th thickness to get the fitting. <laughs> Bored it. Bored it all out to get the, you know, the clearance to fit the other tube because it's I couldn't buy that tubing anymore because it wasn't available. It's right. A, you know, it's just, you know, so I ended up using solid to make the tube. The reason I, they had different drawings is people had forgotten to allow that the spar sweeps and it's got dihedral. So if you put the leg on square to the spar, you have got splayed legs. Well, yeah. that's not right, and they have to be upright. And then you realise actually, because the spar sweeps backwards as well, you've got a slightly different fitting arrangement. Uh, you know, and it's just all to do with all the angles. I project manage the stuff. You know, this is what I was going to do when and everything. And that's what I was saying about doing the wing and the fuselage. I, you know, I get them done. I knew they were big ones. Yeah. Uh, things like the fuel tanks had to be done because the fuel tanks fit in the wings and they have to be fitted in the wings before the wings are skinned. And are they, do you have bladder tanks in No, aluminium? no, they're not bladder, they're aluminium tanks. Just aluminium tanks, yeah. yeah. So uh, again, I got draw original drawings of the tanks, um, which were originally turnplate, soldered, but yeah. Everyone said, that's a bad idea. You want to have aluminium ones. So I had aluminium ones welded up. So there are, each wing's got 11 gallons in. Uh, and then you've got a centre tank. Where, Where does that go? In front of the pilot? Yeah, just, between, just in that bay between the engine and the, and the cockpit. And there's a centre tank in there. Um, and that was a copy of XF. Now, XF actually, after I'd had the tank made, I came across the original tank for XF, which was different. Um, because what, what happened is with Henshaw, he made, he had a whole load of extra tanks made for the thing to get his Cape record. Percival had designed it with wing tanks, a central tank and a rear tank. Hence the C of G. Yeah. All, all linked together, so they all drained down together with one tap. You didn't isolate them, you just, they all filled up and they all drained down again. Um, Henshaw added um, an upper tank to the front tank, which covered the top of the front tank and came back. Now, the tank I had made, and which is fitted to the new goal, is a one-piece front tank. Not as big, because it doesn't come back where the screen was. So there's no upper and lower tank, it's just one piece. Of course, but you, I mean, you weren't it. looking for, you know, South African, South Africa reaching range, were you? No, but I thought, well, I, I'll try and put the, you know, the right sort of size tanks on the thing, rather than having, you know, diddly tanks and not being able to go places. Um, you know, I go down to the south of France and back to see a friend and not have to fill up. You can go there and back, you know, it's not a problem. And it saves a lot wow. of hassle. <laughs> um, Will it actually do that? Oh, yeah, it's got a thousand mile range. Wow. So you said it holds 50 gallons, didn't you? Uh, yeah, 55 gallons. Yeah. Actually. And that was another thing, you know, the tanks were made before the wing was made. And then when you come to fit them, the thing lines up and you, you know, there's all sorts of plumbing nightmares to, to deal with underneath. Um, this has got a starter motor on it, and the same as um, XF has now, and that's purely because you try finding someone who's going to swing a six-cylinder engine for you 
when you're out and about. It ain't going to happen. When it's hot. When, it, when it's hot, yeah. <laughs> um, and you can't start it without someone sat in the cockpit because it'll fall on its nose. It's very light on the tail with, with the engine. If the engine starts, it'll just go straight onto its, wow. onto its nose. Because you, you're sitting way back behind the, yeah, yeah, the wheels in the CFG. So the CFG has to be like that yeah. to cope with when the pilot gets yeah. in. Now you saw that, there's one picture, a famous picture I of Henshaw walking. I saw you picking walking. the tail up. So. Yeah, one picture of Henshaw walking beside his plane, taxiing it. And I thought, that's a very dangerous thing to have been doing. I don't think... But he might have still had the rear tank in at that time. Right. But anyway, so it, it, the engines, so we've got an electric start on there. It's a total loss system. It's just a, you can charge the battery up and you can do 30 or 40 starts on it and you have to recharge the battery. So it's, what, um, what about, so, but you then have got to, um, you've got your fuselage um, and you've got your wing. Burroughs has done the wing, you've skinned it. Presumably yep. Ken Fern has skinned the so you've got the component yeah. parts. Yeah. I had to and do the tailplane and elevators and yeah. ailerons and that sort of stuff. So you made all those. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, uh, where did you put it together? Um, well, the fuselage uh, and all the tailplane and all the engine installation was done in my garage at home. Right. Luckily, I've got a large garage, so I could put it there. I parked my motorbike, put the, the new goal, um up on there thinking oh six months <laughs> three years later the motorbike <laughs> could still was trapped there it weren't going to come out <laughs> um, right so you, you could do all the installation yeah at um, home i did uh, and i made a mock-up cardboard um, engine and all that sort of stuff and very carefully measured stuff and had the engine mounts and um, the the, and the nose bowl and the the, the metal work mm. the actual spat basic form on the nose bowl I had a special metal maker, metal worker the, do the that. The spats are aluminium. Are yeah, it's all aluminium. Everything is all aluminium as it should be. Um, but because it had to be aluminium welded, and I just can't aluminium weld, it, it, just, it just collapses on me every time I try it. I just haven't got the knack. I can do steel, well, but I can't I do aluminium. It, 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 so all, I made all the, the cowlings, and I've got the English wheel, and it's got, you know, it's, it's got a curve on the top of the cowling, so you, it's, you can only just see it. Yes. But it's a compound curve, and the same underneath on the belly panels and, and the you side did panels. All that. I did all that with the en English wheel, mm. and, uh, and did all the beaded edges. And, and, and the, the, the fairings between fuselage yeah, and... Yeah, they're all done. I did all those. Those are all, all aluminium? All aluminium, yeah. Right. There's no fiberglass on it. It's all aluminium as it should right. be. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, there's only a slight difference is on the thing is I've used cross point screws instead of slotted ones so I was fed up scratching the paint every time I tried to undo one so horrible like, bloody things right yeah <laughs> exactly <laughs> you know so you can only go so far <laughs> yeah in practicality this is all dope this is all dope um, color scheme um, 36 coats of paint on it all hand rubbed down <laughs> did you did you put the I paint? I did the whole lot. Yeah. Well, <laughs> the wings, in your garage. The surely. wing was done. No, no. The wing was done in the hangar. In my hangar where I keep the tipsy, I put a big, um, twenty-four foot long gazebo tent, which I got for twenty pounds off eBay at the end of one summer, and it says not for um, not to be left permanently outside. And it was one of these things that would blow away. But it's absolutely brilliant for doing the wing, because inside the hangar, I. I had a trestle for supporting the wing. Um, it was all sealed with nice windows in the thing so the light could come in, but I could put the extractor fan inside and keep all the dust from getting into the rest of the hangar so nothing got covered in paint. I had it horizontal and I thought I'd get a really nice shiny coat, so I used quite a lot of thinners on the last coat because you had thinners and spray mm. it and it mm. gives it. And it looked beautiful. And I came back the next morning and every plier panel dipped wrinkled and what had happened is the dope had soaked through right through to the plywood underneath upwards okay. no no it was, it was lying horizontally oh, it right. soaked so down through it right so you you were painting the wing off the yeah. airplane yeah off the airplane right, no, right. yeah the whole thing's painted separately off the airplane. yes the whole thing was painted off the airplane um and it had soaked through and it had got to the plywood but of course then the upper skin on the paint had set so when you put it on the ply, it sagged, and then it had set, and that's where it was going to stay. And there's nothing we could do to get it off. 
I stripped the fabric off and we try, I tried soaking it, it wouldn't come back. So I then, tears in my eyes almost, went to Roger Burroughs and said, look, what can we do, Roger? Can you help me with this? I don't know what I'm going to do. And he said, so I hired the lorry again, got it back over to, to Roger's. We got it in the workshop, you cut did. off all the ply. Um, and he just said, uh, I think the ply is too thin on there. So we've put a slightly thicker ply on the top. And it, it's quite good now because it doesn't really dip between the ribs. It's, it's as it should be. Um, and we think what it was is because this is metric ply now, an imperial ply, and it was probably just a slightly bit, slightly bit thicker. So this has got the next thickness up ply on the top of this wing there. And so they had to come back again, they had to recover it, redope it, respray it, re rub it down. 36 coats. <laughs> yeah, another 30 odd coats, yeah. 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 Um, and, to, and to match it and blend it, so I, you know, and a lot of MEK are stripping all the old stuff off. One, one more question. The, the glazing, did you uh, do the? Yeah, I did all the glazing, yeah. All the glazing, the glazing bars, yeah. yeah. Uh, have you got a little former to? Not to? Well, because you, you, they, they're, they're not they're flat. They're curved. They're, they're flat, they're curved, aren't oh, they? Oh yeah, you do it, do it with an English wheel and tapping it and, and yeah. just doing hand, panel beating it and getting all the right shape right. And, um, the, and the glazing? And the glazing, yeah. The glazing is um, acrylic for the rear section and the side panels. And the front three are polycarbonate because I thought 250 miles an hour hitting a bird. Hmm. <laughs> and were they, were, are they formed over? Did you for, uh, make a mould? Mm, no, I did. I did start. I, initially, I did, and I just couldn't get an optically right because you looked at such a shallow angle yeah. through it. You're looking through the the, the perspex. So have you, um, have you bent them in and trapped so it? I, I bent them in and trapped them, and yeah. then warmed them up and um, sort of got them to form to shape in place. Wow. But the polycarbonate, you can bend that a lot more than you can perspex. I mean, your journey is, in, in, in a lot of ways, akin to the original. You know, they've lo well, lots, of, it uses lots of some things they, they had to find out. And yeah, it, it, the, origin the very originals had a, a cellophane-based material and the well, not not ordinary fabric. Not, well, it would have been no, no for the screens. Oh, for the screen. Screens. Okay, it right. Was a, a celluloid right. thing, um, but XF with its curved form, which Drax Cross used, actually used acrylic, and it was one of the first aircraft to ever use acrylic. This was in 1937. Wow. You know, it was it had only come out. The acrylic had only come out in the mid 30s. It was it was really. You know, Cutting edge, and then a few other aircraft started using it, of course, then in the wartime. But the very first ones had glass, they were all straight laminated glass. Right. Putting it together, that was uh, uh, a bit of a nightmare. Got it to the hangar, rigged it, um, put, the, uh, put all the metal fittings on. Um, you alright? Is it alright? Yeah, I yeah. think so, yeah. yeah. Put all the metal fittings on, got it all right. Um, all the metal fittings actually have little packing pieces. Now, when they built this originally, they probably had jigs. So they probably had a jig they would drop over the wings and drill the holes through the spars. Uh, yes. And the same in the fuselage. And then the thing was made up. Well, of course, I didn't have that. The only, I've got this. And I talked to... Um, Tony Ditheridge, and he said, yeah, yeah, watch out for the quarter-inch woodworm. We had a lot of that. <laughs> <laughs> Holes which had been drilled in the wrong place. Yeah, no, he said, you know, we had one, we drilled it through this hole, and it came out the bracket in the wrong, <laughs> the wrong hole on the other bracket. <laughs> I thought, oh, great, I can't afford this. You know, this has got to be right. So I did a lot of jigging up, and I made some special guide tools with long bushes. Um, and I made up and got some drill, got some drills and extended them. So um, there's 56 bolts hold the wing on. All of those have got to be drilled and bolted and, and perfectly lined And they're long bolts, up. presumably. Uh, yeah, through the spars they're long bolts, wow. but through the fuselage. But they're all got to go through. You know, you've got to hit a metal bracket yes, on the on inside, the side, on the outside. Yeah. You've got to come through exactly square and parallel with these things, getting right. 
So all of those have to be done. So I made up a whole load of special tools of my own to, to line them all up and guide the drills and started with a small drill and made sure it was perfectly aligned and then opened it out. And, um, but one of the drills was four foot long because to drill the rear spar and clear the fuselage and have a drill, you had to be four feet away because you just couldn't get the drill in close enough. It was the, the how only do way make, to drill in. How do you make a... You, a four foot drill. You get a short drill and you weld on th and you put a, um, a, a piece of tube on it, <laughs> weld a piece of tube on it and then you <laughs> put that in the chuck of the drill and, it's, and you true it all up in the lathe, make sure it's all, all right. Um, make guide bushes and mm. you can get one foot long drills quite easily yeah. and they, they're long enough to go through the actual bushes that I made. But yeah, that was... Um, and you have to have the hardware, the nuts and bolts. You, um, yeah, I, nuts, I, 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 used, I used American hardware, not British hardware. Mm -hmm. the, there are so many nuts and bolts, it was going to cost an absolute fortune mm. if I used British hardware. But I mean, the, the very long bolts you have to have made, presumably. Um, no, no, you can get those in light hair spares. You just ask what you want and they can supply them. Yeah. So, light hair spares did most of the hardware for me. Right. Um, and you know they they list them in their standard sizes. Okay, sometimes I had to you know they they were obviously being made because I said it's two weeks delivery, but uh, fine, not a problem. The aircraft grade bolts all the way through. <coughs> but stuff inside the cockpit like the stick and things like that. You the the spade grip is actually a Percival spade grip. A on, genuine. Yeah, genuine Percival spade grip, not from Mugol, from a, from um, a Proctor, but they're all the same. They always use the same spade grip all the way through and, um, and things like you know pedals and all that sort of stuff yeah the pedals were made to drawings and um, yeah. bits and pieces um, the brakes are drum brakes originally they were cable operated then they went to being cable operated um, hydraulics that's what I've got so yeah, cables going to hydraulics. The cable goes to a bell crank, which operates a yeah. master cylinder. Yeah. But I, what I did is um, I've actually got push bike hydraulic brake levers on the pedals. So and oh, you just operate them with your toes. Yeah, with, with the toes, because that's how they had them. They were cable. That was what they were. They were like push bike okay. brake levers, with cables going down to these other cylinders. But now you can get these modern push bike ones with this tiny yes. hose, which looks like cable. And I thought, well, why put a separate master system to go right the way to the... Because you've got the volume of fluid in there. Yeah, so it went all the way down to the brakes. So, so and done. there's a little reservoir on Yeah, a little the reservoir on the things, yeah. So well, just what just done. top up, though, is it? You just unbolt it and just get it level <laughs> and top it up. And, <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, it doesn't take very much, you know, it's only if the brakes start wearing. You know, you're landing this thing at 90 miles an hour. It was heavy, you know, and trying to do a gentle landing is hard. It didn't look like 90 miles an hour when you came in. Hmm? Didn't look it. Oh, yes, yeah. It was, yeah, was 90 it? miles an hour over the hedge. Wow. Yeah, yeah um, it's, uh, it stalls at 85. <laughs> so you look at the five mile an hour window. That yeah, right yeah, that's the over the hedge. You know, it's ninety-five coming down. Right. Um, in ground effect, it will it will stall a bit. Thing, but I always wheel it on because ground it has a horrible tip stall, really vicious tip stall. On it. Um, in ground effect, if you try to three point it, and the landing roll always ends up being a lot longer. I, I learned a long time ago. I tried to three point the Gemini, and I've seen th the f videos of people doing it. But the more reliable way is always to. Wheel it yeah. on. Wheel on. You can put the wheels where you want them. Yeah. And then you're getting drag. Yeah. <laughs> it's getting going to slow you down and a lot quicker. <laughs> and, and actually, yeah. you, you approach, I don't know, five, a little, a little bit faster and yeah. accept the float. But then you've got, you haven't got a bounce, no. which you... Yeah. That's what I do. And then, so I just, you know, pitch it forward and... Do that. I ha you can three-point it. And if the ground is fairly soft, it's, you can do it quite nicely because mm. the tail skid digs in and it will stop you in a couple of hundred yards then if the ground's soft. But if it's not, it will just float and the wing will come up and then you'll end up with a tip store. And I've just found a video. How does that manifest itself? Does it drop a wing? Yeah, it, it, it just comes up, it'll float and it'll suddenly go like that. It'll Have you had that happen? Hmm? Yeah, 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 yeah. I've touched the wing tip before now. So. 
Yeah, so I don't don't do that normally <laughs> at all. Interesting, there's a video we just found of with um, Edgar Percival doing just that. The actual video of him landing in one of the King's Cups races and how he managed to sa save the aircraft, I don't know. It was well, he, he was a good pilot as well. He flew yeah, but all, once, all once it's gone yeah. beyond a certain point, yeah, no it. amount of skill is going yeah, to get you out. Yeah, that's it. We uh, I showed it to John Mann, who flies, flies this sometimes, and, and their, their thing. And it's how he saved that prop, I don't know. <laughs> mm. Right, longer. so talk to me about the flying characters. I mean, presumably, did, did, who, who did your test flying for you? Uh, Charlie Hook. Oh, OK. Charlie Hook did yeah. my test flying. Um, I asked him very nicely. Um, it was going to be um, Al Mathy, who had helped me quite a lot on the on the project um, with bits and pieces. There are Al two Mathie. Al, Al Mathy. There are two two people who really sort of pushed me on the project, and that was um, Frank Ball, um, who sadly died flying my titch. You know, he was he was you know you've got to have this new girl, and he was just you know driving me to get this new girl. You've got to get it done. You've got to do this and that. So I then co um, contacted um, Charlie Hugh, who graciously said yes he would. What was it like watching your aircraft fly for the first time? <laughs> I wasn't too worried about it. Um, we'd done a lot of taxiing trials and I remember <laughs> Charlie first took it out because they're oleomatics, the undercarriage are with pneumatics and I set them so it looked right and everything else and he came out you've got to do something about this undercarriage. He said I opened the throttle and the wingtip touched. <laughs> Because <laughs> I had them so soft, you know, it was all compliant. <laughs> Can't be like that. <laughs> well, so you blow them up so they go dunk at the yeah, top. Yeah, so they're actually almost yeah. topped out. When yeah. They only just go down about. Are they from inch. something else? Are they a nose leg off no, of no, Tobago? No, no, they're actually something? they're made to the drawings from oh, wow. um, Lockheed. Yeah. The actual fork is is actually from um, Piper Aztec. It's a forging, aluminium oh. forging. It should be uh, a steel tube welded and, and squashed oval but when i laid the aztec one straight over the top of it it's exactly the same shape and i thought this is an aircraft right. one okay, so this is this is often asked it's going to be strong enough i'm not going to have any risk with this so, so you then you made a, a piston to fit well you could have used the piper ones i suppose um i used the 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 chrome leg bit and then it was all adapted inside yeah. to, to, to fit yeah so had to have it all re-chromed and things but have you flown XF? No, unfortunately. I'm not allowed to. I'm not one of the chosen few. <laughs> so. Hang on, you've got one. No. It's, I can understand why. It's part of their collection. Yeah. They, they have rules about who flies things. Jean Mann and Dodge Bailey... Have um, they flown yours? ...fly this one, yeah, because when we do the air shows, I've got a, a solo DA, but I haven't got formation. Right. What well, do they do say formation. about yours compared with...? Oh, it's faster. It's faster, and you can see out of it. <laughs> 